NYC City Planning Commission here in room Lower Concords, 120 Broadway. Today is Wednesday, September 5th, 2018. As the courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chair Largo? Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Commissioner Capelli? Here. Commissioner Cerullo? Here. Commissioner Delaus? Commissioner Dweck? Here. Commissioner Edie? Here. Commissioner Efron? Here. Commissioner Knight? Here. Commissioner Levin? Here. Commissioner Marin? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of August 22nd, Wednesday, August 22nd, 2018, and special meeting of Tuesday, September 4th, 2018. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Scheduling. On calendar numbers 1, 2, and 3, we have resolutions for adoption scheduling Wednesday, September 26, 2018, for a public hearing to be held at NYC City Planning Commission hearing room, Lower Concourse 120 Broadway. On the resolutions, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page 28. <laughs> Borough of the Bronx, calendar number four, CD2, C160161PQX, in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning the LSSNY Early Life Center 2. For a favorable report on calendar number four, Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? No, he not. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number four. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number five, CD9, C160160, <coughs> PQX, in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning Watson Avenue Early Childhood Center. For a favorable report on calendar number five, Chair Lago? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number five. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number six, CD5, C160331, PQK, in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning the PAL Arnold and Marie Swartz Early Learn Center for a favorable report on calendar number six. Chair Lago? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number six. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number seven, CD2, N180188ZRK, in the matter of an application for a zoning tax amendment concerning 180 Myrtle Avenue. For a favorable report on calendar number seven, Chair Lago? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number seven. Yes. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers eight, nine, and ten. Calendar number eight, CD2, C180265, ZMQ. Calendar number nine, N180266ZRQ. Calendar number 10, N170267ZSQ. In the matter of applications, <coughs> for zoning map and zoning tax amendments and for the grant of a special permit concerning 69-02 Queens Boulevard. For favorable reports on calendar numbers eight, nine, and 10. Chair Lago? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cer Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Recused. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 8, 9, and 10. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 11, CD3, N180336, RCR, in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 
Canton Avenue and Holcomb Avenue for adoption on calendar number 11. <clears throat> Chair Lago? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. <clears throat> calendar number 11 has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar numbers 12 and 13. Calendar number 12, CD1, N180254, ZAR. <clears throat> calendar number 13, N180255, ZAR. In the matter of applications for the grant of authorizations concerning 11 Haven Esplanade. For adoption on calendar numbers 12 and 13. <clears throat> Chair Lago? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar numbers 12 and 13 have been adopted. The next part of the calendar is public hearing section on page 40. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers 14 and 15. Calendar number 14, CD1, C180391, PQX. Calendar number 15, C180390, HAX. A public hearing in the matter of applications for acquisition of property for UW, <coughs> UW designation and disposition of city owned property concerning 599 Colton, Coltland Avenue. <coughs> We're going to have a 10-minute team presentation by the applicant team comprised of Kay Real, Peter Prasida, and then three other members who are available for questioning, Alan Mulhadam, Scarlett Narori, and Winifred Campbell. Uh, is this on? Good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. My name is Kay Real, representing the applicant HPD. It's my pleasure to present you with a proposed new small development to be located at 599 Cortland Avenue between East 150th and East 151st Streets in the Bronx. This development will provide eight units of affordable rental housing in a new four-story building. In 2005, the city conveyed the, this property to proceed a development group under the new foundation's home ownership program. The intent was to replace the then existing deteriorated building with a new two to four unit building with ground floor commercial. Due to the small size of the project, ULERP was not required and disposition was approved through the accelerated UDAP process. The project ran into difficulty due to the structural instability of the adjacent abandoned church. The church was demolished, but the project was ultimately stalled due to economic constraints. We are now proposing an eight unit building that will provide affordable rental housing along with ground floor commercial. Due to the new size of the proposed building, ULIP approval is now needed. Because of disposition, ULIP can only be done on city owned property. The city must reacquire the land in order to go through ULIP. This is why this ULIP is intended to give the city authority to both acquire and dispose of this land. We request your approval of this action to support a project that is responsive to community needs and is appropriate with the neighboring context. Also here to speak to the details of the project and or answer questions are Prita Prasida and Scarlett Naraki representing the developer Prasida Development, Alan Mogadam representing the architect Urban Architectural Initiatives and Winifred Campbell also from HPD. Uh, thanks, Kay. Uh, good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Peter Presido, representing uh, the App or Presido Development Group and Cortland Development Group. Uh, as Kay stated, we were under working on construction in 2005, and due to the instability of the next door neighboring church, uh, the project stalled. And the as the crash hit in 2007, 2008, uh, the financing became a challenge for the project. Uh, the site is located by the hub, as Kay said, between 151st and 150th Street on Cortland Avenue. Uh, it's about two blocks from the subway stop, as you can see on the map uh, above. Um, the site is located next door to a vacant lot and a mental health and uh, methadone clinic on the corner owned by the New York Psychotherapy Center. We reached out to the neighboring property uh, owner about acquisition. They presented us with a number that was 
uh, extremely unrealistic. Um, okay. So <laughs> we have moved, moved forward with the intent to develop uh, this four-story building on our 25 or 29 by 100 foot lot. The adjacent building to the, the north is a pre-war four-story build, or sorry, five-story building uh, with ground floor retail. Uh, caddy corner to the site is the Bronx Documentary Center, which was developed at the same time as this site was supposed to be developed uh, under the the uh, homeowner, the new foundation's homeowner program, where the the ground floor is occupied by the shopkeeper, uh, with, uh, which is a Bronx, the Bronx Documentary Center. They do um, photo exhibitions. It's a gallery. They also do some after-school learning programs. Uh, and then he lives above, and he has a couple of tenants in uh, a few of the other units in the building. Uh, our site plan is relatively simple. It is a four-story building. The fourth floor is set back. We have ground floor retail on the first floor. Uh, it's a walk-up building. There are there's a ground floor studio located in the back that has a small private terrace. And there's a public terrace, uh, public rear yard for the rest of the the, the tenants. Um, it, it's you know due to the size of the site, it is pretty small and relatively simple. But we we do think it's a nice amenity. There's ground, uh, there's laundry in the, the cellar for the tenants as well as some storage. Um, there, the development team is comprised of Presida, uh, UAI. We're still working on a on finding a general contractor. Presida has been a GC based in the Bronx since the 70s. Uh, we are uh, thankfully have outgrown projects of uh, this size and are looking for to find either a local or an MBE based uh, a local or a WMBE contractor to work on this project with. Uh, we've reached out to a number of individual firms through the uh, HPD uh, WMBE build up program and have been attending events uh, with the goal of finding uh, qualified contractors to, to build the project. And the Wavecrest management team, which is a group that we've worked with in the past, is going to be the managing agent of the property. Um, as I said, we have eight units, five studios, two one bedrooms, and one three bedroom. The three bedroom is located on the top floor. It has a private terrace. Uh, the two one bedrooms are on the second and third floor, and then the studios are mixed between the, the first, second, and third floor. There's about 750 square feet of ground floor commercial space. That number is likely to come down slightly. Um, as you may have seen in your report, the borough president had two recommendations. Uh, one was to, to use a non-chain link fence around the property. Uh, we are intending to use probably a wooden fence, but it will not be, uh, that hasn't fully been decided, but it won't be chain link. And then the other recommendation was to provide access to the small trash room in the interior of the building. Right now we are studying exactly how that's going to work with ADA and everything, but um, uh, it'll just decrease the size of the retail, so that number will slightly decrease. Um, in terms of affordability, uh, these units will be affordable to households earning 60%, 80%, and 100% of AMI. Given the small unit size, we do realize that this is somewhat above the average income in the neighborhood. Uh, but we do feel that with you know mostly studios and one bedrooms, there is a population uh, of individuals who are earning these incomes, who are you know young professionals who are looking for rental housing close to home, grew up in the neighborhood and may or may, you know may work in the city, uh, and given the um, access to transportation with the hub right nearby, we think that this is a, a good um, development for them to uh, take a look at. And I guess if there are any questions, that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Levin. <clears throat> Yes, I, I guess I have a question that's mostly for HPD. Um, you know, on pieces of city-owned land, we usually like to see as much um, affordability as possible. I realize this is a very small project that has had um, an additional range of challenges to it. Um, um, I appreciate Mr. Proceed is sort of acknowledging that the proposed 
um, income levels here are honestly above um, the the area's income levels. Um, how did H how has HPD looked at a project like this, and how do we um, how can we be comfortable that this is the best use of city-owned land? Because as we all know, when the city is involved, that's our opportunity to push for maximum affordability. Um, Right, so our finance team has uh, modeled a number of scenarios to try and target deep affordability in this project, and they have determined that it really isn't possible. It doesn't have the economies of scale that um, generally allow for projects to target deep affordability since um, uh, the development and costs are fixed. HPD has already um, committed maximum subsidy to this project. Um, the project size also um, makes it not competitive for project-based vouchers and tax credits. So um, these are the AMI levels we feel work best for, for the okay. size of the project. Okay. Is, I imagine there's a hefty amount of the subsidy is in the form of the um, land price. Um, is there other city subsidy? Well, first off, is that a correct assumption? And second off, is there other city money going into this? Um, it's HPD money and uh, uh, Article 11 tax credits. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Arfa. Yes, what is the length of affordability, given that the numbers are probably close to market now, but over time, as this neighborhood um, changes, there may be an opportunity for um, lower rents through long-term affordability? Our regulatory agreements are generally from 30 to 60 years. Okay, and this one hasn't been determined, but it'll be 30 or longer. Right. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Thank you to the applicant team. There's no one else who's signed up to speak on this matter, but if there's anyone present who would want to be heard, now would be the time to come forward. <coughs> okay, then this public hearing is closed. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number 16, CD5, C170146, PQK. A public hearing, in, excuse me, a public hearing in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning the Friends of Crong Heights 17. Madam Secretary, are there any people signed up for this? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, our first speaker in support will be Allison Grant. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Allison Grant, and I am the Chief of Staff at the ACS Division of Child and Family Wellbeing, and we oversee the subsidized child care system. ACS is here today in favor of the continued use of the space as a daycare center. As you may be aware, the space is designed specifically for child care services, and we would like for it to remain as such. Uh, this program is contracted to be an early learn program which serves child care children, which means that they their families uh, must be eligible for care, earning up to 200% of the federal poverty level and must have a reason for care, such as working, being in school or a training program, currently homeless, or looking for work for up to six months. Uh, the current contractor at this site is Friends of Crown Heights, as you said, and they um, are permitted by DOH to serve 95 children, and currently their budgeted capacity by ACS is 80 preschoolers do to making sure they have enough space for all their children. Um, as of this week, they're at 80% enrollment, which is in line with this time of year. Quickly, I'm gonna show you some pictures and I'm happy to take any uh, questions you may have. So this is the location um, in the Crown Heights neighborhood. Uh, the exterior, um, it looks like it was taken in a not very green time of year, but uh, it actually does look quite nice. <laughs> and there's an appropriate rooftop for play. Uh, the classrooms, as you can see, are appropriately um, equipped for ch young children under age five. Uh, hallways are, are wide and brightly lit, and there's a room for um, play in case it's a clement weather outside. Uh, and I'll leave it on the classrooms. If there's any uh, questions, I'd be happy to take them. I'll also note that available for questioning at this time are Monica Rich from ACS and Dale Lazarson from DCAS. Questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Levin. So notice the photos show a large set of stairs going up to the front door. Is there, how does ADA access work? And I don't see that we have a plan in our. Okay, they're not in my pictures. Um, 
Well, Monica was delayed, and she would be the one who would have that answer. Okay. I think that there's a back oh, there you are. too. It's okay. Sorry, Monica. I think there's here. a secondary exit for ADA. I'm sorry, Monica Rich, ACS. Mm. So. Okay, so there is. Um, Yes, there's full ADA access. Yeah. I noticed the scope of work does include ADA compliance, so I assumed that there was a way. There's a whole section on ADA compliance. Okay, there's the a way area, in. So. Okay, and it's not down an alley and in the back door? Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Monica. Sorry. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. And um, again, these are the only speakers who are signed up on this item, but if anyone is present who wants to testify, now's the time. Okay, so this public hearing is closed. Bar of Brooklyn, calendar number 17, CD6, C180418, PCK. A public hearing in the matter of an application for the site selection and acquisition of property concerning DOT Brooklyn Fleet Services. Our first speaker in support is Leroy Branch. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Leroy Branch, representing uh, Brooklyn Borough Commissioner's Office, Keith Bray. I'm joined by my DOT and DCAS uh, colleagues to present the ULEP application for 2514 Street Fleet Services Repair for Maintenance Facility for your consideration and approval. DOT has a great need for vehicle repair and maintenance facilities since the operations at the Brooklyn Armory Terminal was discontinued in 2012 when the lease was terminated by the landowner to pursue other uses for the site. In 2015, DOT engaged DCAS to find a new location that will support the new Brooklyn Fleet service operation. This site was identified as an ideal location to serve DOT vehicles that were distributed throughout the five boroughs. The Hamilton Avenue asphalt plant is across the street from this facility, and the Gowanus Expressway is easy accessible, which will improve efficiency throughout reduced travel times and improve truck routes in this site. This facility will be able to accommodate all of our large, mid-size, and small range vehicle types. It will help facilitate an increase in all of our large vehicle service times, which will support DOT's citywide land resurfacing targets and other fleet services related to cost reduction efforts. This site is located near the F, G, and R trains and four bus lines and given the, uh, the employees public uh, transportation to and from to work. On the next three slides, three and four and five, or the exterior of the building. This slide and slide four is from the view of 14th Street. And the next slide is the view of mid-block on Hamilton Place, looking towards Hamilton Avenue, 14th Street in the Gowanus area. The final side is the site plan, is the layout of our facility. The site has the on-site employee parking to accommodate about 25 cars. There is a parking area to be used as a staging area for 60 vehicles awaiting maintenance and repair. We are planning for this site to receive about uh, 120 vehicles and admittedly throughout the course of an 18 hour work day. The facility will have 15 workstations and up to 15 large vehicles and nine workstations for medium and full small vehicles. Given the number of spaces available in the staging yard and the number of workstations inside the facility, this site is sufficiently accommodates DOT trucks and vehicles on site and will eliminate the need to park DOT trucks and vehicles on the surrounding streets. As you can see, there is a blacksmith shop area used to craft replacement parks in the rear of the facility and work desk stations towards the front of the facility as well. The site will have uh, 15 employees working several shifts, mainly Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 11.30, Thursday and Monday, 7 to 3.30. Thank you, Thank Mr. You Branch. Thank you for your time and consideration. I'm open for questions. And I'll also note that Mr. Branch is joined by a number of his colleagues from DOT, as well as Dale Lazarson from DCAS for questions. Yes, Commissioner Efron. Thank you for your presentation. It does seem like a great building and one that I hope the city will consider, consider a very long-term lease or even acquisition through a purchase of. But um, my question is, with 15 employees, why there is a need for 25 employee parking spaces? Well, what we're, what we're doing is that's 15 employees working at some different shifts. So what we will have is people using, going back and forth using that space. There's going to be times where they're going to overlap. 
And so we're going to need uh, that, that space for, for parking vehicles. I guess the community pointed out that its access to public transportation um, raises the question of why employee parking is needed at all. Are, is that something you want to respond to? Would answer. The answer for that, Deputy Commissioner Eric Dorsey and um, DOT Fleet Service Division, the 15 um, positions he's speaking about are 15 mechanics. The supporting staff, which would be parts personnel, um, you know, front office personnel, whatnot, would take up the additional spaces from the 15. There'd be at least five, at least five supporting um, people working in the building, and any particular shift. Um, and uh, do you want to respond to the community's concern for why, with such great public transportation, there's a need for employee parking? Is that typical? Well, we, we're going to encourage public transportation, but again, sometimes it's just not, you know, accessible um, by public uh, uh, transportation, depending on where the people are coming from. But we are going to encourage it, and with that, those many spots, I mean, you know, I think it's adequate. I've seen many sites with at least that many, you know, parking spots which get filled up. Okay, I, I will say it just seems ironic given that it's DOT and there is a, uh, you are the custodians of our streets <laughs> and um, to add more parking and to add more vehicles to the streets unnecessarily just seems. And mind you, the, the staging area that's the, you know. Could you speak this, into the microphone since we're recording? Thank yes, you. Yes, the staging area, which is for the 60 vehicles, is actually not adequate enough, you know, to support um, the triage of the vehicles. So I'm, I'm sure that that's going to expand into the parking area. Okay, I, I, you've just basically told us that you don't think this is adequate for what you need to do. Is this space adequate for what you it need? It is to do? adequate for what we want to do, but at least it gives room to expand if we don't use those 25 spots. I would suggest that you take from the questioning that the commission takes seriously the recommendation from the community that there be strong encouragement of using public transportation as opposed to private vehicles. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you, Chair. Other questions from the commission? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and like with the prior two public hearings, those are the only speakers who have signed up to testify. If anyone else feels so moved, now's the time. Okay, this public hearing is closed. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers 18 through 23. Calendar number 18, CD 16, C180485, HAK. Calendar number 19, C180486, PCK. Calendar number 20, N180487, ZRK. Calendar number 21, C180488, ZSK. Calendar number 22, C180489, ZMK. Calendar number 23, C180490, ZSK. Public hearing in the matter of applications for UDAP designation, project approval, disposition of city owned property, site selection and acquisition, zoning map and zoning text amendments, and special permits concerning Mark, the Marcus Garvey Village. <coughs> Okay, we will have a 10-minute presentation by the applicant team, which may be the largest applicant team we have wow. yet seen. Uh, it's making, exciting. Making the presentation will be Richard Lobel, Sandy Hornick, Josh we we Weistuck, and Mark Ginsburg, and then available for questioning as part of the applicant team are Lisa Gomez, Carrie Lowe, Colleen Alderson, Jocelyn Toro, and Lynn Zeng. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Again, Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel. We're here today to discuss the Marcus Garvey Village rezoning. Um, and uh, the applicant, Brownsville Livonia Associates, is an affiliate of L&M Development Partners. With me today, uh, as mentioned by the Chair, are Lisa Gomez and Josh Weistuck of L&M, as well as Mark Ginsburg from Curtis Ginsburg Architects and Sandy Hornick, consultant to my office. We also have representatives of HPD and the um, and the Parks Department with regards to several of the city-sponsored actions. Um, while we do have a large applicant team, we have a, also have a large project. This project is uh, for a 
24 unit residential mix and mixed use development, uh, which will be inclusive of approximately 750,000 square feet, uh, including 616,000 square feet of residential development, uh, approximately 100,000 square feet of community facility development, and 37,000 square feet of commercial development. This uh, development, uh, will be 100% affordable. So you can see on the map here is the location of the uh, Marcus Garvey Village rezoning. It is contiguous with the existing Marcus Gar Garvey Village and you can see the boundaries uh, roughly on the screen, the centerpiece of it being the Livonia Avenue corridor, uh, which currently has the elevated rail line. And so what we have here is the opportunity to redevelop a number of underused uh, surface parking lots with uh, affordable housing and mixed use development, thereby uh, bringing much needed affordable housing to the area as well as enlivening this corridor along Livonia and uh, to some extent or, uh, along some of the other streets. Uh, the current zoning of this uh, property and the parcels included within the rezoning are, are six uh, with some C23 overlays. The proposed rezoning would rezone these to R72 with C4 overlays. We feel this is appropriate and will be discussed later in the, dis in the presentation given the spacing of the current development, the fact that there are a lot of underutilized lots here and uh, it creates kind of a broken uh, uh, area and an area where there are many gaps, uh, including in the uh, commercial uh, retail area. Um, you can see here the development sites that are listed. They include seven development sites consisting of all our parts of roughly 13 lots. And uh, this is a general uh, view of the site plan again with the centerpiece being Livonia Avenue with additional sites located along Chester Street. Um, with regards to the actual proposed zoning actions, we have six actions which are considered here. The first being the zoning map amendment which will change portions of the R6 to R72 districts and R72 C24 districts. We feel that this bulk is appropriate as will later be discussed by Mark given the existing context uh, development in the area with regards to uh, building heights and with regards to the fact that you have many challenges developing around a, an elevated rail line. The existing developments are often uh, set back and there's often gaps in the development as was discussed. The proposed actions also include a zoning text amendment which of course will map um, the uh, Appendix F to include the development sites in option one and option two and the affordability of the, site, of the sites and the development will be discussed later um, by Josh. The special permit that we're requesting is pursuant to a large scale general development. This is pursuant to 74743, which includes uh, bulk modification for uh, allowable lot coverage as well as the location of buildings with regards to height and setback and distance between buildings. Uh, I'll run through the remaining three actions and then uh, hand the presentation over to Josh who will discuss some of the details behind the history of the development at the site and the acquisition and, and the uh, community discussion moving forward, which will be fo followed by Mark discussing the, discussing the architectural aspects of the development and then of course we're happy to answer any questions. The final three actions, uh, one of which is the applicant's uh, res co uh, sole responsibility is 74532. This is a special permit pursuant to the most recent uh, uh, text amendments for zoning for quality and affordability. This is a reduction or waiver of parking requirements for accessory group parking facilities. This waives existing parking requirements for these 294 accessory off-street parking spaces. Those are currently existing spaces which has, has been demonstrated by evidence in the record are severely underutilized and present an opportunity uh, in accordance with, uh, with prior guidelines issued by the department as well as Housing New York. And the final two actions on which the applicant is a co-applicant with HPD and with DPR are the first UDAP uh, designation for the disposition of certain city-owned parcels within the uh, development area, as well as the acquisition of, of property uh, and site selection for an acquisition site and an easement area. This will house a community garden uh, and, and the easement area will allow for existing community gardeners to be able to utilize this, uh, the entirety of this area. Um, Finally, as far as the zoning change map is concerned, you can see in front of you uh, the general R6 and with some C23 overlays along Rockaway and, and the, uh, and the uh, rezoning 
uh, as is contemplated. So I'm gonna hand it over to Josh. Thanks, Richard. Um, so I'll, I'll try and blaze right through. Uh, what we've done is acquired the site, it's a Michelama property, it's privately owned by a uh, subsidiary of L&M, Marcus Garvey Preservation. Uh, in 2014, we did a large scale rehab that includes all the 625 units, uh, security, building envelopes, site work, um, and we've realized some great transformations. Uh, uh, crime is down significantly, and uh, once 20% vacancy rate is now a one-year wait list. We've also done a lot of community investment. Um, we did a survey uh, in conjunction with the Sabaeth Group, a nonprofit in the city, and we installed a urban farm, a summer camp, and a youth clubhouse, and also did a lot of resident activities, uh, like family day, and things of that like nature for the residents. So looking forward to the project. Um, we've got seven buildings uh, across the, what is now Marcus Garvey Village, and what I'm presenting to you is what the commission certified. Uh, we have been speaking with the council um, since the community board vote and are addressing their concerns such as affordability, setbacks, and parking. Uh, we originally came with a 12-story proposal um, after two years of work with city planning. Uh, that's down to seven to nine-story buildings and, um, and certain setbacks and, and requirements that uh, you've seen in, in the proposal. Uh, it's 724 units. Uh, we have built the flexibility uh, for 830 units or so. I believe uh, that allows us to um, swap some community facility space. Um, and our goal is to activate the Livonia corridor uh, underneath the elevated train with vibrant community uh, and retail that we've heard from the, uh, the community. Uh, this is in line with the Brownsville plan, a large scale neighborhood revitalization effort by the city. Um, I've pulled out Livonia 4 and Ebenezer Plaza, both 420 and 530 units respectively. Uh, affordability, uh, our underlying, our, our main goal is to be at 60% AMI and below for 80% of the units and um, and the balance 20% uh, at 60% to 80% AMI. Um, we're addressing density and, and deep affordability, which is in line with the 60% or so uh, existing average. Uh, again, this is what the project currently looks like underneath the trains, uh, so we're looking to liven that up. Uh, our timeline is to start, uh, to finish ULARP in, in March and start phase one at the end of 2019, and I'll pass it over to Mark Ginsburg. Thank you. I'll go through this very quickly with the time, which is, right. okay. So here is a axonometric view of the seven buildings, the five along Livonia, surrounded by the existing Marcus Garvey Village and the two on Chester. And as you can see, the neighborhood has a varied height. Uh, then this is a site plan, again, as talked about the major concept is activating Livonia as a town center. Uh, so we developed the buildings. So the on the left are the five buildings along Livonia. On the right are the two buildings and their relationship to the existing Marcus Garvey Village. On a Livonia, we set back a minimum of five feet to widen what is a relatively narrow street with the elevated subway. And in both of them, we developed relationships to Marcus Garvey Village of, in terms of setting down, setting down to it, um, stepping down to it and the height. Uh, and then along the railroad, the elevated subway, we realized that the building will never be perceived in whole. It will either be perceived by people on the subway for the top part of the building or from the street. Uh, we are extending the upgraded lighting of Marcus Garvey Village. I'll just go through very quick. I'm sorry, but, Mr. Ginsburg. It was okay. a 10 minute team presentation. Thank you. And now questions from the commission. Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Could you go through the site plan for us? Uh, let me go back to the site plan. Well, I'll use this site plan, which also shows the open space, so that there are the five buildings in the center that are along Livonia, uh, 
Up at the top of the screen is uh, the Rockaway subway station. The bottom of the screen is the Betsy Head Park and Pool. Uh, um, and this we look at is uh, creating a town center. Then stepping, then we have the two other buildings along Chester that are away from the elevated train. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, those will have some uh, ground floor community facility, but will uh, will have a little commercial at the corner possibly. But the concept is to create the major commercial space in the corner, and then you can see around it is this pointer work, and this is all the existing Marcus Garvey Village, which has both units on the street and then muses along here, uh, which uh, we helped L&M renovate a few years ago. Does that answer your question? Other questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Levin. I wonder if you could go back to the affordability slide, please. That went by very quickly. Uh, we, we tried to make a last minute change here, um, and uh, I guess it didn't take in the slide. It's 20% of 60 to 80 AMI, and 80% of below 60. We're, we're looking to do tax credits and uh, the city's ELLA term sheets, or as this is a, a multi-phase project, whatever term sheets are available to us at the time as the city uh, changes term sheets every every three to five, six years. Okay, good. That's a Apologies good clarification. Thank good catch. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Efron. Yes, if you could just elaborate about um, the work you're doing with the community to respond to their concerns about parking. Hi, Commissioners. Lisa Gomez. Um, we are value... Pardon? My back. Hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We are, we, we've met with the community board. We've met with uh, various committees. We've met with both electeds. We have two electeds here in the borough president's office. So we are, excuse me, evaluating um, adding back some parking potentially in sites F and G, which are the long buildings. We're not fully there yet, um, but that's something we're studying. Thank you. I just want to say welcome back also. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Levin. I wonder if someone could address, uh, maybe you, Lisa, the, um, the proposed programming for um, the uh, community facility space and the commercial and whether you have thoughts about um, tenants and is all that space going to be filled and that kind of thing. Sure. Well, we do have, we have many thoughts. We always have thoughts. But um, we've given ourselves the most flexibility sort of in the unit count. Um, but we wanted to sort of, you know, as Regina Meyer used to say, the, the loose sweater approach. So we, we gave ourselves the max flexibility that we could. It's our expectation that over time maybe um, as we develop these, some of that second floor may become uh, residential. But we have a number of partners, some of who are here to speak today, um, who have been working with us in our existing complex, uh, bringing services to residents and the neighborhood. So some of the folks we and have expressed an interest in expanding on those services. Some, so some of the folks that we've, uh, we're working with are Grand Street Settlement, who is a partner we first met on our Essex Crossing project, and uh, with whom we've developed a really terrific relationship. They're working in several of our sites. Um, Brooklyn Kindergarten Society, uh, Children of Promise, um, I'm trying to think of who else, uh, a couple of other daycare providers, um, and as uh, Brownsville Community Justice Center we are currently working with, um, and they're looking for a permanent home as well. So we have a number of them. It's early to lock any of these down, you know, funding changes over time. Um, but, you know, we think that some of these are, are certainly great contenders. Commissioner Ortiz. I guess uh, along those lines, thank, thank you. Um, uh, there's, I guess, over about 150,000 square feet of space we're talking about, more give or take. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you go about making the decision as to, you know, what, how much of that should be dedicated towards community facility versus retail? I mean, how do you begin to understand the market um, for that demand? And then how does it interface with some of the existing retail that's along Rockaway? Right. Well, some of those existing retailers are actually our retailers. We have a portfolio of about a million, one, two, three 
uh, square feet of retail and community facility uh, space across our portfolio. Much of that is at the base of buildings very similar to this. We have a dedicated retail team that does market analysis, that has looked at gaps. A supermarket is, you know, it's, it's always at the top of everybody's list. Um, Banking services here were something that were, were, were found to be under underserved. So we've done some market research. We've also um, worked with the community board, and we've committed to working with the community board and asked them to advise, appoint sort of an advisory committee so that we're bringing things to the neighborhood that the neighborhood wants. It's, as you know, it's not an exact science. It's who, who can lease space at the time at which it's available. Most of these are not pre-leased spaces. You know, if it's daycare, it's who got funding in the most recent round. If it's banks, it's what's happening in the banking world. So we try to be nimble. Much of the space won't pre-lease. Some of it, if it's large, you know, we, we wouldn't sort of build spec community space. If, you know, if Grand Street said, oh, no, we don't think we can, we can uh, absorb that. So it's an art and a science. And as we go, we're, we're going to continue to, you know, collaborate with the community, collaborate with the nonprofit partners, collaborate with retailers and try to bring the best mix we can. Often, you know, we, we worked on Livonia One with uh, with Martin Dunn, and one of the things we did was we, we looked for, for uses that um, that would be complementary. That did mean, you know, leaving space vacant for a couple of years, and when we absorbed the cost of that because, you know, the community didn't want another dollar store, or, you know, and that's what, who would, would be happy to come in. So we try to be thoughtful. We don't always get it 100% right, but we try to sort of take into account what the needs are empirically as well as what the community wants to see. I, I mean, it's good to hear that you've done some mar market research <laughs> to sh support uh, the projections here. Um, and, you know, this challenge of vacancies over time, I mean, uh, you know, do you and anticipate that being a challenge here, or do you think the demand is just sufficient? Well, look, I think we all know that the landscape of retail has changed. I will say that in our portfolio, which is the majority of our space is, is this kind of space, in, in the boroughs at the base of buildings, we have less than a 10 percent vacancy rate, which in the world today is pretty good. I mean, we have a team that's focused on it. Is it always going to be that way? I wish I had a crystal ball, you know, but I think we will continue to um, look at it and study it. And if it doesn't make sense, we won't build it, um, you know, and that's why we sort of gave ourselves that flexibility on the second floor. Great. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Then thank you to the applicant thank team. Um, we'll now turn to speakers in opposition. Uh, Richard B Buchanan. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Logo and members of the subcommittee. My name is Ricardo Buchanan. I'm an underman, and I work at Esplanade Gardens, and I'm also a member of 32BJ for 37 years. I'm here on behalf of 32BJ, and especially on behalf of the 19 union workers and sisters, brothers and sisters, who works at Marcus Garvey, and are at work now. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service worker union in the country, representing 80,000 building service workers in New York City. I'm here to tell you just how important it is for L&M development partners and the city to ensure high quality, prevailing wage building service job are part of the development plan of this site. These are the kinds of jobs that have allowed myself and the current workers at Marcos Gave Village to support our families and live with dignity in New York City. 32 BJ projects that they propose in field project at Marcos Garvey will create 10 new building service jobs. There is no currently commitment at this, at this will be good jobs with the family sustaining wages and benefit. As a result, we are concerned that the new development at Marcos Garvey will generate a second tier substandard low wage building service jobs and undercut wages and benefit of existing workers. We fully support additional affordable housing at Marcos Gavis site, but we also believe that taxpayers should not subsidize low jobs 
by my union brothers and sisters and brother at Brownsville community. Deserve better, we deserve better. This is why we are calling on the City Planning Commission to ensure that L&M Development Partners and the City create prevailing wage building service job as part of the extension of Marcos Gavis site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Questions? Thank you. We'll now turn to speakers in support, beginning with Clovis Thorne. Good morning, commissioners. Um, my name is Clovis Thorne. I'm with Grand Street Settlement. I'm the Director of Development and Communications. Uh, I would like to speak in support of this project. Uh, since 2014, when the improvements were made at uh, Marcus Garvey Apartments by l and they partnered with us to provide after school and summer camp services in the development. Uh, we, this, of our 28 youth programs across Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn, this is the only one that's completely privately funded. Um, there's incredible need in the area for these kinds of services. We, we operate this program and also programs in the area, and they're all oversubscribed, sometimes by more than 200%. And so, um, again, Grand Street Settlement strongly supports Marcus Garvey expansion to build more community facilities, and we look forward to partnering with l and to provide high quality enrichment programs to the families in Brownsville and at Marcus Garvey. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Thorne? Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Cyrus Smith. Hey, good morning, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Cyrus Smith, and I'm the program advisor with Brownsville Think Tank Matters. Uh, Brownsville Think Tank Matters' mission is to build uh, communities by maximizing its resources, empowering its residents, uh, revitalizing its image, and encouraging um, and enhancing its public safety. Uh, we re do receive joint funding from uh, l and uh, development, as well as uh, Dunn development, and May's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, at this point, we are working with the LNM development on a public safety initiative um, that reduces violence in and around Marcus Garvey through what we consider as an innovative approach um, to addressing violence in community. Uh, we are working with uh, area residents, encouraging them to pursue careers in um, public safety as well as in the uh, building trades. Uh, to date, we have employed, uh, we have trained and employed over 40 people in the area into entry-level careers in public safety, starting with security. And right now, we have 15 people on a wait list waiting for the city to call for careers in corrections, uh, NYPD, uh, health and hospital police, as well as uh, traffic agents. Uh, so we have taken people who are long-term unemployed and underemployed uh, from earning roughly about 15, uh, 12 to maybe 16,000 a year, I notes. Uh, and right now they're on the track to make at least $40,000 a year or higher for the rest of their lives. Right? Uh, as an organization, we do support uh, L&M's plan um, to convert the uh, unused lots into affordable mixed-use uh, housing uh, developments uh, because one, um, like we'll give residents a greater sense of, of security and that uh, users of the underdeveloped space will, in addition to bringing additional community resources, um, you know, like it adds you know, like to the overall quality of life and community. And with that, uh, you know, like I'll open it up to questions. Questions? Yes. From the commission. Yes, Commissioner Levin. This has nothing to do with this application, but I'm just curious. You mentioned at the beginning that you have a um, particular, and I, I guess you, I don't know if you used the word unique, approach to violence reduction. That's correct. In the area. Could you describe that a little bit? What's the... What's the approach? Well, in 2016, uh, we received a grant from uh, Dunn and l and Development mm -hmm. uh, to support um, an anti-violence initiative. Uh, so it was a three-layered approach. Uh, we started with uh, an initiative called the uh, Public Speaking for Social Justice, where we went into community and we asked young people to address conflict. Uh, we taught public speaking, uh, but it was really a conflict resolution. So we're teaching the public speaking 
uh, through the lens of um, conflict. Uh, we're teaching conflict resolution through the, lens of, through the lens of public speaking. And then also with that uh, grant, we were able to purchase a curriculum. Uh, it's the Nonviolence Project Schools for Peace curriculum. Uh, if anyone goes to the UN, you'll see the knotted gun. Uh, the knotted gun is the universal symbol for world peace. And Brownsville Think Tank matters along with the New School for Social Research are the only organizations in community uh, or in the city that's allowed to teach and implement that curriculum. So with the purchase of that curriculum, we started going into the schools and community groups, uh, implementing a nonviolent schools for peace curriculum. What we did was we started addressing public safety with the young people. And l and allowed us, as well as Dunn, allowed us the time to cultivate those relationships with community and family. Uh, but we realized that we needed to do some work with the adults. Um, so one of the thoughts is, uh, and this is the long answer to your question, the thought is um, if we have more people in community working in public safety, uh, they tend to be better neighbors. So in theory, who would not want someone working in public safety to be your neighbor? Uh, they tend to be, you know, like better neighbors. Uh, so we went to the most critical, you know, like people, uh, again, who are long-term unemployed and are underemployed. Um, explained that uh, security is the gateway or the entry. Uh, so we use funding to pay for the uh, eight-hour, 16-hour security license, and then the FO2 fire guard exam. Uh, we pay for the uh, licenses and fingerprints. Um, and to give you all an idea, you know, like total course per participant is roughly about $400. So again, we are able to take that $400 per person investment and turn it into a $40,000 a year higher uh, life change. Um, but again, uh, it is a public safety initiative, but um, of course we, when there's a, a you know, when there's an act of uh, violence, uh, we do go out into community um, and then we do react. Um, we are responders uh, through the Maze, uh, Justice of Criminal, uh, Maze Office of Criminal Justice, so we do uh, respond, uh, but the better work that we do is on the preventive side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that description. It goes far beyond land use, but um, we appreciate right. your service. And thank you, Commissioner Levin, for um, asking that question. Um, well, those are the only speakers that we have signed up for this matter, unless there is someone here who would like to be heard. Okay, the public hearing is closed. Bar of Manhattan, calendar number 24, CD 12, C150263, PQM, a public hearing in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning the UFBCO Child Care Center. And our first speaker on this matter will be Allison Grant. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Sorry, it's just me. <laughs> it's never just you, although I do think you I qualify know. for our frequent <laughs> testifier program. <laughs> yes, I have Stephen and Monica with me to answer questions. <laughs> so um, for the record, my name is Allison Grant, and I'm the Chief of Staff for the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing at the Administration for Children's Services, and I'm here today in favor of the continued use of the space at 474 West 159th Street as a daycare center, as it was designed specifically for child care services, and we would like it to continue as such. Uh, this program is contracted to be an early learn program to serve children from three to five years old with the United Federation of Black Community Organizations, also known as UFBCO. Uh, they are contracted to serve 117 preschoolers, and as of last week, they were at 84% enrollment, uh, which is typical with this time of year. I'm happy, I'm gonna first just click, quickly click through to show some pictures. Oh, really got quiet. Um, the location, as you can see, is near some parks, which is very nice for the kids. The exterior facade, um, it looks kind of like an office building, but is very warm and friendly inside, as you'll see. Uh, some great art. Uh, you'll see the classrooms are equipped for young children, lots of windows. Uh, the cubby area, wide open hallways, and then the rooftop, which has been fixed, and children are now able to play on this rooftop. There's also ground floor space available um, adjacent to Edgecombe, uh, which is around the corner for them to play on. Uh, this is a great play area here that I just mentioned. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. And I will note that we also have available for questioning Monica Rich, Stephen Lynn, and Del Lazarson from a combination of ACS and DCAS. Questions? Okay. Great. Off the hook. Thank you. And as always, I'll ask if there is anyone else present who would want to be heard. Okay, if not the public. Hearing is closed. 
Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 25, CD3, C180290, ZSM, a public hearing in the matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning 9 Orchard Street. We will have a 10-minute presentation by the applicant team comprised of Caroline Harris, Gagan Singh, and Stephen Carter. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. I'm Caroline Harris, a partner at Goldman Harris, representing the applicant, which is uh, DLJ uh, Real Estate. Uh, I'm accompanied uh, by the two people um, mentioned by the chair um, who are here to answer questions if you have any. Uh, you had a very fine presentation yesterday. Oh, there it is. Is this the, there we got it, uh, regarding uh, the proposed uh, special permit for 9 Orchard Street, which is located at the intersection of Canal and Orchard and Lower East Side. Uh, the zoning district is a C62G since 1984. Um, the building involved is um, the Yarmolewski Bank Building, which is uh, an individually designated landmark since 19, uh, constructed in 1912 and designated in 2009. It has a distinct uh, history in lower, in the immigrant life of New York City, uh, having been one of the only banks that would extend credit to new immigrants who had no established credit lines in New York City, in New York. Um, the uh, dome that you see there on the original building was removed uh, in the 1990s. Uh, because there was damage to it. Um, landmarks approved the reconstruction of the dome spire and access to it by stairs and a handicapped lift. Uh, Department of Buildings approved the reconstruction of the dome, uh, which is underway, um, as was explained yesterday, um, it, because it was a pre-existing uh, dome uh, and is deemed to be a permitted obstruction because it's a spire, a dome spire. Um, DOB allowed the reconstruction to move forward. Um, LPC also approved a penthouse enlargement of the building, which you can see under construction uh, in, in the picture. Uh, the waiver requested, as you can see, the building is much taller than anything else in the neighborhood. And uh, the sky exposure plane, which are the angled lines uh, on the diagram, uh, if it were a brand new building, uh, the landmark building would not be able to be constructed in its uh, as it is today, and the sky exposure plane cuts through the 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 building. Um, because of that, uh, the uh, client is requested a waiver uh, of height and setback requirements so that the a deck could be uh, on the roof could be made higher. Uh, Roof decks are permitted obstructions to height, um, but only to the extent of three and a half feet. Um, the request would extend that an additional four foot four inches um, so that the area that's uh, hatch marked on the waiver plan would be able to be raised above mechanical equipment um, and would also enable access to the uh, domed spire uh, from the uh, entrance uh, exits and the doors that are uh, associated with the penthouse enlargement. Um, without the rooftop deck being able to be heightened, um, there wouldn't be able to be a stairway and well, there could be a stairway and a and a a lift, but people who are handicapped would not be able to get to the to the lift, and people would have to walk down a step in order to get to the edge of the penta uh, the roof. So that's our request. The community board approved, uh, recommended approval of this, and uh, the borough president also gave us a positive recommendation. Uh, the BP's recommendation was delivered yesterday. Any questions? Is that the end of the that's is that the end of the team presentation? That's that's it, unless you have questions. Great, questions from the commission. Commissioner from. <coughs> yes, um, what will the actual um, space be used for <laughs> in, um, the, in the round, and what is its capacity? Um, and if you can give us a sense of whether you would see people above the balustrade or uh, they fall below that. 
Okay. Um, the enlargement uh, of the pen, the penthouse enlargement um, is designed to be an event space restaurant type of facility. So the rooftop would be used in connection with those events. Um, the uh, there's it's not floor area in in the dome spire. People would be going up to the dome spire to look at the view, maybe take a wedding picture. Um, it's not uh, intended to be a separate event space by itself. It's not large enough to do that. The capacity, I can, uh, the architect could answer that question. Um, I'm happy to introduce Gagan Singh to answer that question. Uh, Mr. Mr. Singh, could you answer how many people could access the dome spire at a single time? It will be about eight to 10 people. I see, okay. And, and will Speaking they the appear from the street above the um, the balustrade or the uh, yeah. um, when they are inside the dome, they'll be standing at the f um, at the level you see right at the base of the columns in this image, which is almost at the height of the parapet of the rest of the roof deck. So it's three six. Um, it's slightly more than that. It's uh, I think yeah. about four feet, 10 inches, something like that, above the, um, above the roof deck. Right, That's that the level of the dome spire. But the parapet itself is three feet, six inches, once we uh, get to this level. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In terms of visibility from the street commissioner, if you look at this photograph. Um, yeah, it would be very small. Yeah, you might see someone's head. Yeah, no, so it's really a head, it's not a full. No, you wouldn't yeah. see a full body and uh, because of the perspective, the height of it compared to everything else, it would, a person would barely be visible. Thank you. Commissioner Capelli. Uh, yeah, she had mentioned the borough president's recommendation yesterday. Yes, ma'am, yes, had, sir. Uh, some uh, conditions that, uh, that she discussed with you? She did not discuss them with us. We only learned of them yesterday. And so what is your view? towards her request? So the client has a very extensive history of uh, community engagement in this neighborhood uh, on its own volition. Um, it's been involved, uh, it has owns several properties including 3-5 uh, Essex Street uh, where there's a bamboo garden and they've been involved with Henry Street Settlement in making that accessible to the children and elderly. They're working with Think Chinatown, hosting events at 5 X Essex Street, Seward Park Conservancy um, on efforts to renovate historic Schiff Fountain and Plaza. They've provided resources towards the initiative. They've worked with, uh, they're working with Space Block Association and Lower East Side Partnership, Lower East Side Settlement Network, Asian Americans for Equality, um, uh, with opportunities to use the space inside the building. Um, they've met with Eldridge Street Synagogue and the Tenement House Museum about extending tours to the building. The client is clearly has a history and a commitment to community engagement and trying to make other properties as well as this property uh, available to the public for view. They are, especially having just learned about this request last, last night or yesterday afternoon, um, the initial reaction is reluctance to commit to any specific number of events or activities, both because they have to deal with logistics, uh, programming space, um, the operational issues that relate to having different groups of people come in the building, um, and security issues. The uh, rooftop space is not a restaurant, it's an event space, and so it will not always have staff there. So they have to th think through whether they could make a commitment to a specific number of of uh, uh, activities on a specific schedule. They are clearly moving in the direction of having such events and making the space accessible to the public from time to time. And so they certainly embrace the essence of that uh, recommendation, but um, right now can't respond to having 12 specific events during the year. Uh, so yes. How long do you think it will take the uh, applicant to uh, to come up with an answer to that question? It's an evolving, I'm certainly going to be discussing it with them in the next couple of weeks, but um, I'm not sure that it's possible to, certainly to come up with six specific events 
or 12 specific events, what they are committed to is working with different local organizations to make those uh, opportunities possible. Maybe it'll be 24 times a year. I don't, we don't know at this point because they're working in conjunction with other organizations and those other organizations also have their programmatic issues to deal with. Commissioner Dweck. Um, okay. Commissioner Capelli touched on my uh, question, so thank you. Other questions from the commission? Thank you. And uh, today is the day of short hearings. There's no one else signed up to speak on this matter unless any of the remaining folks in the room feel so moved. Okay, the public hearing is closed. Madam Secretary, anything else before us? Madam Chair, if I might. Yes. Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, may I have uh, affirmative votes recorded for items four through 13 on today's calendar? Gladly. And I will note that we have gone through six public hearings in an hour and 15 minutes. And with that, the meeting is ended. Thank you. Thank you. Same program, Richard?